Hey, thanks for joining us today. My name is Drew Ketchum. I'm the campus pastor down at the Green Campus. Uh, when I was in junior high, uh, my family wanted to buy a ski boat. Uh, see, up to that point in my life, uh, we spent uh, our year doing really two things. For two-thirds of the year, we'd be playing hockey or, or figure skating for my sister. And the other third of the year, we would spend on the lake or the river uh, skiing and kneeboarding and inner tubing and later on wakeboarding. And uh, we did this through my dad's job. He was a firefighter, so we would spend a lot of time uh, with the other families at the station uh, during the summer and spring. And my family got to the point where we wanted our own boat, so when we went out, we could take other people out on the boat, kind of relieve the backlog, and also, in our own time, spend time out on the water. And I remember the first boat uh, that we went looking for to purchase. Uh, it was a boat owned by, uh, I think it was my dad's friend, at least a friendly enough that he trusted my dad to take out the boat by himself. And so we, we hooked it up to the trailer, uh, the back of the truck, and we took it to Alder Lake, which is a lake up in northwest Washington that's beautiful. And we got there, and uh, we set out to put the boat in the water. And it was my family, me, my sister, my parents, and my buddy Joe. And so we get the boat in the water, and Joe and I stay with the boat. We sit in the boat. We're standing there uh, tied to the dock. And my parents and my sister take the truck and the trailer back. They're taking it up the boat ramp. And this boat ramp there is just a long, long boat ramp, the biggest one I'd ever seen. And it goes up and over. And so they take off to park the truck and the trailer, but they also take off to use the restroom. And so here are Joe and I, we're about 14 years old. We're in this boat <laughs> and something uh, starts to catch our attention. It seems like we're slowly sinking just a little bit at a time. And then it seems like this is actually true because it's not just sinking. There is now water collecting and pooling at our feet. And Joe and I begin to panic. We're like, oh my goodness, we're going to sink. We're done for. And we start, you know, we get our hands in that cupping and we start tossing and bailing water over the side of the boat. We're freaked out yelling and screaming, and no one's there. There's no one else on the boat ramp. All the boats on the lake are way, way out. No one can hear us. We're freaking out. <clears throat> and it seems like an eternity passes before anyone shows up. And we look up the boat ramp, and here's my mom and my sister coming over the top, and they both stop and pause, and I can just see it, even though I can't actually see it. Their eyes just get wide, and they come hustling down the ramp and jump in the boat, and now we have four people bailing water out of the boat. My mom, she has a Coke bottle. She dumps it out, and uh, there's a knife somewhere, and she cuts the top off, and she's scooping and bailing water out with this thing, and we're at the point now, it feels like we maybe uh, are getting as much water out as is coming in, and, but we can't maintain this forever. And again, it seems like an eternity of us doing this. And the reality is it's like two or three minutes <clears throat> before my dad arrives. And I just want to pause here before we move on to the story. Like, the level of our panic does not match the level of the real issue, right? We're at the end of the dock. If the boat sinks, even at 14, the water's like chest high, right? We're not in the middle of the ocean where if we sink, we're dead. Like, it's just a really bad day if it happens, so here comes my dad down the boat ramp. He's running. It's like, what's going on? The boat's sinking. We're freaking out. He runs back up the boat ramp, jumps in the truck, whips it around, and comes barreling in reverse down the boat ramp, jumps out the truck, grabs the strap, hooks it to the front of the boat, and reels it in. And everything is good. As soon as it comes out, water just starts dumping out the bottom of the boat. <sighs> and come to find out, there's a really good reason why water was coming in the boat. See, <clears throat> boats have this thing called a plug, and the plug goes in the bottom of the boat, and it allows you to drain any water that comes into the boat, right? You're out on the water. It's reality water is coming in. So uh, my dad did put the plug in. But what my dad didn't know, or maybe he thought was already done, I'm not really sure, it's years and years ago, was there was a second plug on this boat, all right? And he didn't do that plug. And so water was still coming in. And what we learned that day is if you don't put both plugs in the boat, the boat won't float. <laughs> and the truth is, and what we're going to be looking at today, 
is that when we look at the work of Jesus, there are two parts that we need to focus on. And when we skip and miss out on one of those parts, you miss the entirety of Jesus's work. And so we're going to be looking at, and what I'd like you to turn to, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in this, uh, in this book, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And there, there's a disagreement brewing. There's actually a lot of disagreements brewing, but there's one that we're going to focus on in chapter 15. And it has to do with bodily resurrection. All right? So this church uh, is a fairly new church that is made up of pagans and, and Jewish influence. And a lot of them have a really hard time believing that a body can resurrect, right? There's influence from the Sadducees. There's influence from paganism. And so they're perfectly fine with the idea that uh, there is a spiritual resurrection, but a physical resurrection just won't do it for them. And Paul writes in this letter, he basically says, whoa, 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 slow down, boys, all right? You cannot skip the bodily resurrection because if you skip that, if you leave it out, you've skipped over and left out the entirety of the work of Jesus So he starts off chapter 15. It says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you believe in vain. Paul starts off and says, I gave you a gospel. I gave you a very specific gospel for a reason, because if you don't have this, your belief is founded on nothing. It is in vain. It's wrong. And he's going to go on and explain it. He says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. See, Paul lays out that the gospel he gives includes the resurrection and that the resurrection is part of the foundational truth. That if you take the story and divide it up into parts and pick and choose what you like, The gospel doesn't work. Salvation isn't possible. Death without the resurrection isn't enough. And of course, resurrection without the death doesn't make sense. Um, But he wants to be very clear to the church that you have to have the the entirety, that you have to find faith in the entirety or you're in trouble. Just like me and Joe on the boat, one plug without the other plug doesn't do the trick. And death without the resurrection doesn't do the trick. They're just where Joe and I were. They are sunk. And he's going to go on and explain why this is important. Why do you need to understand the resurrection? Why can you not just toss that part out and be fine with Jesus' death? And so he goes on in the next passage in 1 Corinthians 15. And he explains, and I love how his writing is. He says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, We are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Paul says that he gave them the gospel, and the gospel is good news. It literally means good news. And if you leave out the resurrection, it's no longer good news. It's terrible news because it means that Jesus didn't do the job. He failed at his mission, and who Jesus is in the resurrection defines who we are. And Paul goes through this, and he kind of does it in reverse. He says, without the resurrection, 
you are also kind of define who you are. And he goes through it, and I highlighted some of this. these. It says, one, your preaching is useless. So is your faith. You are false witnesses. We are false witnesses. Your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. That's the people who are of the faith who died already. There's nothing left for them. And at the end, we are to be pitied. Paul play, paints this incredibly bleak picture of the reality that if Jesus dies for our sins but doesn't resurrect after it, we're in deep, deep trouble. And there's several of these I want to kind of spend some time in, right? Because they define who we are, and then we'll touch a little bit afterwards about how the reverse is true and what that means for us. So the first one is that we are liars, that Paul says that as, a, as a, a preacher of the gospel, that he would be a liar. His preaching is useless, all right? He's a false witness about God, which means he lies about God. And think of the implications for that, what he has based his entire life on, going around to all these different places, planting churches under the idea that Jesus is, both dies and resurrects. He's been lying about everything. He's been misleading everyone he's come in contact with. And not only has he been doing this, but the apostles and the people of this church, they've been lying to who they're talking to. And this goes on through all of history, that me standing up here today, I would be lying to you. Everything I've put my life into is built upon a lie, that pastors are liars. And this has implications for everyone here. Because not only am I lying, but we as followers of Christ who are charged to go out and share the gospel, to spread the good word, we are lying. That if we leave out the resurrection, we're leaving out the offer of salvation, and we are in fact liars. All that we do is for nothing. That discipleship is really a waste of time because it's based upon a lie. He goes on further. He says, and this I'm skipping back and forth a little bit. If you catch that, this is at the end. That we are to be pitied. That this idea that we are followers of Christ, Jesus says that it comes at a cost. Paul reinforces it comes at a cost. That when we commit our life to Christ, that when we make him our Lord through the actions that he has done, we give up so much. We sacrifice. We stop living according to the flesh and start living according to the Spirit. That we are persecuted. That we are hated. That we have to give up things that we enjoyed before out of a response to God. And Paul says if this is true, and the resurrection isn't, that if we do these things and there's no resurrection, that we should be pitied. There was this old... Uh, saying about 10 years ago said there was YOLO, right? And Paul is basically saying, if, if there's no resurrection, we should live by the mantra of YOLO. And for those of you who don't know, YOLO was this acronym, Y-O-L-O. -O, that means you only live once. And the idea is that every day you should make the best of it. You should do whatever feels good. You should take every opportunity and every risk because once your life is over, who cares? That's the end of it. You get your 79 years or whatever it is, the average life expectancy in the U.S. And after that, it's all over for you. So live it up. And Paul even goes on and he says, he goes into this. And for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day, yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That we as Christians, we strive for a heavenly reward of being faithful to God, all right? And that includes our eternal life with Him. If there's no resurrection, none of that's true. And so every day, we should eat and drink and be merry and find joy or happiness in whatever is good, looks good, not what is good, but looks good in our lives. And we should just go for it. Because otherwise, our life is pitiful. And what I love most about the, the thing, the YOLO idea is, it's true. You do only live once. It just happens to be forever. Okay? That <laughs> for us as followers of Christ, 
we have our life here on earth, our 79-ish years, but we also have an eternity after that to be with Christ. And we sacrifice these years uh, as we're transformed by Christ, living out him, spreading the gospel for the future, for not for just for us, but for all people that turn to him. The last thing he says, and that's there repeated several times, is you're still in our sins. That our faith is futile. It's in vain. It's worth nothing. Because in the end, it means nothing. And I really want to just stretch this out a little bit and explain it a little more. And so I want to give the whole of the gospel, right? And we at Family Church, we, we like to use these, these four stages of the gospel. There's creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. So it starts out, God creates everything. The world, everything in it, all of creation is done by him. And on the final day of creation, he makes humans. He creates Adam and Eve. And he creates them in his image. That means it bears, we bear his qualities. But he creates us perfect without sin. We're righteous because of him who has created us. And he places them in the Garden of Eden, Eden paradise. He places them with him so that they can be in perfect relationship with him. And he gives them one rule. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just one rule. That's it. Not so hard to take care of. And yet, most people know this, whether they're followers or not, right? That Adam and Eve are deceived by the serpent who is Satan, and they're deceived. They eat of the fruit, and sin is introduced into the world. And ever since then, original sin exists that we are part of that sin and we are born into sin. And this creates a huge problem because they, Adam and Eve, and everyone after that, cannot be with the holy, perfect, righteous God. And so God shows up. He says, Adam and Eve, what are you doing? Where are you? And he knows and they lie. And they try to trick God. And in the end, he says, you just can't be here anymore. See, they have sin, and sin often we think of as doing bad things to other people, but sin is just disobedience to the will of God. They have tried to substitute God for themselves as God, to follow what they want. And God says, because of that, you can't be here. And he sends them out. This is the fall, right? He sends them out, and they're left with two big problems of sin, right? The first is that God has created this system of justice. It's built into, uh, it, into the fabric of all existence. That sin against God demands a price to be paid. And Adam and Eve and all of us, we can't pay this cost. And the second one is it leaves us eternally, spiritually dead. And so Adam and Eve leave Eden with this problem, but God gives humanity this this, this law to work through. They have this opportunity to pay the cost of the sin. And so there's this system of animal sacrifice that humans can take their best animal and, and offer it up to God as sacrifice and they transfer the sin to the animal. It's kind of weird and confusing to us nowadays, but this is the system God has created. And humans exist under this system. And through this system, though, it has shown that we are incapable of being righteous. We are still sinners. We can have something pay the cost, but it's just not enough. But as Adam and Eve had left the garden, God makes a promise. He says that he will one day send a descendant who will crush the head of the serpent, who will defeat sin and death and redeem all people to God. And so thousands and thousands of years go by and the third stage of the gospel, redemption comes along. And Jesus shows up on the scene. He's born of a virgin Mary. He lives a perfect life. That is, he has no original sin. He never sins, which I just want to pause and say uh, is incredibly impressive because I don't think I've made it a day without sinning. He makes it his entire life. He dies on the cross. And then he is resurrected. And this part where he dies and is resurrected is what Paul was getting to. He says, everything's been building up to here. And these two parts are one part of a whole. You cannot skip 
either one. See, Jesus dying on the cross, what he does is he takes the sins of the world upon himself. He is the perfect sacrifice because he is perfect and righteous. He takes all of our sin and he suffers and dies for it so that the cost of our sin is paid for. But if Jesus, if his story ends there on the cross, our salvation is not taken care of. It's not enough. That Jesus has to come back to life, that he has to defeat both sin and death for our forgiveness to be possible. See, in coming back, we are brought back to life. We are resurrected with Jesus, in Jesus, and given new life. And then Jesus goes forward and he justifies us. That means that he goes in front of God for us and declares us righteous. And I want to say not made righteous, that's in the future. He declares us righteous in front of a righteous, just, perfect God. And he says, the righteousness of Jesus, he substitutes it in front of our own and says, this is how you are saved. All of this action in one as a whole is what saves us. The work of Jesus isn't just on the cross, it's also in the tomb. And if we skip the tomb, the resurrection, we've skipped the whole thing, we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And because of this, the fourth part of the gospel is we are a new creation, that we are resurrected with Christ and we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we are changed from the inside and it impacts how we live. Excuse me. He goes on to say, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Paul starts off and he says, because of everything he's laid out, the entirety of the gospel, both death and resurrection, we are changed. And he says, therefore, right at the end, therefore, that means because of this, we are changed. And he lays out several ones. The first one I see there is he says that, excuse me, we are to stand firm, let nothing move you. That because of the truth of the gospel, that we can stand firm in it. That Jesus came and he gave the parable of the man who builds his house on both the rock and the sand. And Jesus says, if you find any truth in anything other than the gospel in Jesus, you're building your house on the sand and it will be knocked away. But if you build your house, your life, on the firm rock, which is Jesus' death and resurrection and the salvation it offers, that we can stand firm, that nothing can move us, that we can go through life looking back on that in all that we do. And it impacts everything we do. He goes on to say, oops, he goes on to say, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Because of what he has done, as we go forward into our life, we can always look back to that and impact how we go through our day-to-day -day business. Whether we're at work, at home, or at play, we can strive for the work of the Lord that is sharing the gospel, that the work of Jesus that has changed us, we can go through life sharing because we have a firm foundation on which we have established our lives. And then beyond that, he says, because you know that the, excuse me, you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Because of what he has done, as we work for the Lord, we don't have to worry so much about what, our, what it is we're accomplishing. Because here's the deal. It's not our accomplishment. It's Jesus's accomplishment. It's not about achievement. It's about obedience. That as we go forth sharing the gospel, living out gospel-centered lives, we don't look to ourselves. We look back to Jesus and his resurrection. And I got to say, this one really stuck out to me, the idea of living it in vain, that we labor in vain, that sharing the gospel throughout my life, sharing the gospel as a pastor, often leaves me feeling insufficient. 
that I've shared with people who I thought I did the greatest job in the world, I gave the greatest presentation, or spent the most time with them, and therefore they should be changed. And I've walked away and said, nothing has happened. They haven't given their life to Christ. And when I look entirely at just the results in that moment, I'm crushed. And the truth is, it's not about me. That I played my role in God's story. I shared the gospel. But I can find fulfillment, not in what I've done, but in the work of Jesus. That he has done the work and I am just sharing. Some of us, uh, for you guys, last week we handed out prayer cards. The Easter prayer cards. And some of you have shared over the years that these prayer cards that you're praying for people to come to know Christ, to invite them to church, you feel that it's been futile that these prayer cards that you've been praying for these people for years and years and nothing is happening. And the prayer cards aren't about you doing something to change these people. It's about you joining in the story of God as he's working in them. And the truth is you may never see the fruit of what you are doing. But the work that Jesus set out to do has already been accomplished. I want to just touch on really quick the importance of what Paul was trying to get across, that one, we have a foundational truth that Jesus came and lived and died and was resurrected. And because of that, it can impact who we are and what we do. Thank you guys for joining me. Uh, We have some uh, missional moment coming up, so I'm going to dismiss to the campuses. Thank you guys. I love you and have a good day. For those of you watching online, here is your missional moment that I just spoke on the idea that Jesus came and was resurrected and it impacts how we live. And so what we're asking you guys to do is live a gospel-centered life in in a missional life in which we go out and share the gospel. And so we have this strategy we've been been sharing with you guys and it sounds repetitive because it is repetitive because we want to make sure we're focused on doing it. And so what we want to do is begin with prayer. That we want you to every day, hopefully, start off praying to God that he would bring people into your life that you can bless and be a blessing to. That you can ultimately share the gospel, join God in where he's working, all right, and share both the death and resurrection of Jesus and what that means for them. But first, before that ever happens, all right, we want to do this. We want to begin praying, all right. We want to set out with this, not looking for it uh, in our own way, but looking for how God is already working. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. I love you and have a good day.